Back in 1672, Newton's reflecting telescope enabled astronomers to get their first clear view of our solar system. But to see deeper into space, engineers building the 180 centimeter Parsons telescope in Ireland must learn how to make bigger mirrors. In 1839, Irish astronomer William Parsons begins to design a huge telescope. He hopes it will help solve one of the mysteries of deep space. Astronomers have observed strange luminous clouds in the night sky. Parsons wants to find out what they are made of. Were they made up, let's say, of glowing particles of dust or gaseous matter? Or were they made up of infinite numbers of stars so far away that you couldn't see a single individual star and only emitted a weak light? So what do you do? You build a giant telescope. To have any chance of capturing the light from these faint specks in the sky, Parsons needs a giant mirror. In the time of William Parsons, telescope mirrors are concave, like shaving mirrors, laboriously ground by hand. Someone who knows all about mirrors is Dr. Maggie Adairin Pocock, an engineer who fits them into space telescopes. Since her teenage years, she's been grinding her own telescope mirrors. So with these two pieces of glass, if you sprinkle some abrasive powder between them and then rub the two surfaces together, if you keep on rubbing and rubbing and rubbing, the two surfaces of the glass change shape. The top one becomes concave and the bottom one becomes convex. Mirrors like this, made by hand, are actually some of the highest quality mirrors because of the random nature of the movement. This random motion means that any slight mistakes will be smoothed out over time to create the perfect concave mirror. But Parson's mirror is too big to grind by hand, so he designs a machine to do the job. He uses a steam engine to rotate the metal mirror to be. Then he lowers an abrasive disc onto the surface of the mirror and connects it to a pair of arms. A revolving wheel moves one arm, which in turn shifts the grinding disc to and fro. A second wheel disrupts this steady movement. This irregular motion replicates the randomness of the human hand. The completed mirror is enclosed, not this time in cardboard, but at the bottom of a great wooden tube, 17 meters in length. The tube is suspended on chains between two massive stone walls. Counterweights allow it to be lifted with ease towards the heavens. When this telescope was opened in 1845, it was one of the great scientific events of Victorian England. The great and the good were here. Scientists, philosophers, arts people, and also to ordinary people. It was the inauguration of one of the most wonderful great machines in the history of science. Parsons points his great machine at one of the mysterious luminous clouds in the sky. He sees not dust, but stars. Today we know that he was looking at the Andromeda Nebula, a galaxy neighboring our own made up of billions of stars. William Parsons' telescope acts as the great stimulus for the next great giant telescopes of the early 20th century and, of course, into our own day and age. Mm -hmm. 
It's 1997. Whilst the huge rotating enclosure of the large binocular telescope is still under construction, 150 miles away at the University of Arizona, the team tasked with building the 8.4 meter wide mirrors are trying to find a way to give them a particular curved shape called a parabola. Creating a parabola with glass is simple, so long as you melt the glass first and give it a spin. In here, I've got some water, which is representing the molten glass of the mirror. So what I'm going to do is spin it up gently, and as it starts going faster and faster, the centrifugal forces will move some of the fluid outwards, and you get your nice parabolic shape. And there we have it, the parabolic shape. To do this on a large scale, technicians at the Mirror Lab build a giant rotating furnace into which they load 21 tons of glass. Opticians have to check each piece of the imported Japanese glass for flaws. The furnace heats the glass until it melts, whilst spinning at seven rotations per minute. Centrifugal forces push the molten glass into a parabola. To maintain this shape as the mirror cools, the furnace is kept spinning for another 12 weeks. Next, the mirrors are polished to create the perfect surface. Even today, the polishing tool is designed to mimic the random action of the human hand. Normally, if you're doing it by hand, if you're an amateur telescope maker, you rub, you have some kind of grit, and you rub on this surface to make it as smooth as you can. Well, this polishing tool accomplishes those same things. It has pads that you apply to the surface of the mirror and it rubs the mirror. These actuators apply a different amount of force moment to moment that changes the shape of that underlying surface. That means that each pad is pushing down with a little different force and a little different angle of attack moment to moment as it goes over the surface of the glass. In the final stages, the polishing tool removes a layer of glass just 100 atoms thick each time it passes across the disc. To complete the process, a thin layer of aluminium must be applied to each disc to create the mirrored surface. Engineers placed the glass disc inside a giant bell jar. Powerful pumps suck out all of the air from the jar to create a vacuum. Crucibles on the side of the jar superheat small amounts of aluminium. As the liquid evaporates, molecules of aluminium float through the chamber and condense on the surface of the glass. Vacuum ensures the molecules spread evenly across the entire surface to create a flawless, reflective mirror. When freshly coated, the mirrors are able to capture over 90% of the light which enters the telescope. After almost four years of spinning, polishing and testing, the mirrors are finished. The outcome was spectacular. The deviation from the perfect figure was about 25 nanometers. That's about a millionth of an inch. And it's as if the Atlantic Ocean had waves no bigger than one inch tall over the entire extent of that ocean. So it's a beautiful surface and one that when we put it to use on the sky, we see how good it is.